So uh, when I got the um, email from uh, Elliot and the team about uh, kind enough to invite me to do one of the talks today, I did ping back a quick yes um, and then sort of did a 20 minute kind of panic run around the kitchen thinking, what am I going to do this on? But of course, the best thing to do is, is what you know best. Um, I've been mudlarking for the last sort of five years or so. Uh, but I'm also a frog. I did my frog training um, with TDP in April 2018. And what I found, I suppose what I really wanted to do was to sort of merge the two together today to look at, sort of reflect on my own mudlarking practice. It's that sort of journey from baby mudlark to somebody who's actually looking at things perhaps a bit more seriously and how my training with TDP has made me view the foreshore with sort of fresh eyes, if you like. So I'm not just looking for things. I'm looking at, you know, structures and revetments and uh, barge beds and graffiti and mooring posts and all of that sort of thing. Um, so it's added sort of greater depth to my mudlarking knowledge. So just in case anybody doesn't know, what is a mudlark? Um, Poor little mudlark there. The Oxford English Dictionary describes um, a mudlark or a mudlarker, you can use either, either word, as a person who scavenges in the river mud for objects of value. And um, the word, I think, first probably came into use uh, late 18th century, very much in the 19th century. Mudlarks were scavenging for, uh, they were the poorest of society, they were scavenging for things like coal, and wood and bits of iron, scrap, copper, anything they could sell. The river was a very dangerous place then. I mean, it still is, but more so then because it was very polluted. Um, and uh, they, they, they mudlarked in very, very poor conditions. Henry Mayhew, who was a, a well-known uh, journalist and social commentator in the Victorian era, um, wrote about them in London Labour and the London Poor very evocatively talking about the, the, the sort of filthy rags, the lack of shoes, uh, and the sort of desperately poor sort of state they, they, they mudlarked in just to eke out a living. Um, I mean, of course, for some mudlarks, it was a golden age. They actually did find antiquarian finds, but I think most probably didn't. Thankfully, today's mudlark is uh, more of a hobby. It's a passion. Um, you know, we blog about what we find, we Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, YouTube, writing books, or all sorts of things like that. Uh, but what we have in common is we're still looking for rubbish, basically. We're still looking for rubbish from the Thames. Uh, you couldn't possibly do, or I couldn't possibly do, a, a, any kind of little lecture on mudlarking without... Uh, mentioning Ivan Ole Hume. Um, for those of you who don't know, he was a, uh, I think, not very good playwright, perhaps safe to say, also a theatre manager who became uh, an archaeologist. And in 1956, he published uh, this book, Treasure in the Thames. It's very difficult to get a copy, so I wish they'd sort of bring that back into print. I'm not going to tell you how much I paid for that. Um, <laughs> suffice to say, we all ate cardboard for the next month. Um, it, it's very expensive to get hold of, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. And uh, Ivan Old Hugh mudlarked, uh, it, I think, from about late 40s after the war, particularly on the stretch of foreshore between um, Southwark and London Bridge on the South Bank and North Bank, sort of Trig Lane, Queen Hythe. Of course, in those days, he was finding lots and lots of things, perhaps 15, 20 quite significant finds every time he went out. Nowadays, you're lucky if you find one, uh, but even that is, is um, you know, something that is, I, I always appreciate whenever I find anything. But I do like his philosophy, which is kind of at the centre of, I suppose, um, my mudlarking philosophy and those of others as well, I suspect. Uh, many of the river's treasures are objects of importance, regardless of their lack of context. And I think he, that, that sort of really speaks to that whatever you find, um, even though we don't know, most of the time, we don't know the provenance of what we find. We don't know who owned it, who lost it, where it came from, its sort of journey down the river. But it, it does still tell a story of forgotten people of, of the past. And um, for me, particularly, my 
my background is actually it's a bit like coming home today because I did my history degree here at the LSE a long time ago. Uh, this building wasn't even there. So my sort of knowledge of history is very traditional, kings and queens, Gladstone, Disraeli, and so on and so forth. Um, for me, mudlarking has sort of filled in that, that gap because it is about ordinary people whose sort of stories you know, are in danger of falling through, through the cracks. Um, a few months ago, a friend of mine um, sent me an article from The Guardian uh, for about 2017, and it was a study from about 1979 uh, by Michael Thompson called Rubbish Theory, which I think is a sort of continuation of, of, of Ivor Noel Hume's sort of musings about Thames rubbish actually being quite, quite important, even though we don't know where it, necessarily where it came from. And um, it's about sort of whether rubbish has value or not. And I really like this, actually. Um, I really did like this theory. And he talks about, I suppose, three categories of, of sort of rubbish, which you can relate to the sort of finds that we find on the foreshore. So transient, here today, gone tomorrow. Durable, a joy forever. And rubbish, um, which is sort of self-explanatory. And those things do sort of can move about. They're not fixed. You know, how do we put a price on things? And, um, you know, it, 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 it sort of makes me wonder as well what the future of this is. You know, we, we look at the, the pottery and the things that we find, and they can be very beautiful, even though they're not particularly, there's no monetary value uh, to most finds, unless um, you're lucky enough to find the, the piece of gold, you know, or something like that. Um, most things are not valuable uh, in a monetary sense, but they do have a value in terms of knowledge, and that's really what we, we look at and we research. And in terms of rubbish theory going forward, say, in about 100 years' time, I guess looking at that bike, I mean, probably most of you can recognise where that stretch of foreshore is there. Um, that's uh, Cannon Street, uh, Swan Lane Pier. And of course, somebody has very kindly deposited a bike on the foreshore. It does make me wonder why, you know, whoever it was couldn't just take it back to, to wherever they found it. Um, is that going to be the rubbish of the future for mudlarks in 100 years' time? Um, or, you know, may, maybe it will be, I don't know, if we don't have cars or whatever, perhaps somebody's going to go, oh, there's a bike there, you know, and it's going to be something of, of great wonder and quite marvellous and <laughs> will help them get from A to B. But I suspect a lot of the rubbish we're going to be leaving behind, things like plastic um, and, and stuff like that. So, you know, perhaps quite depressing when we're sort of thinking about the, the future. So um, most mudlarks um, find these kinds of things on, on the foreshore and um, a whole sort of range of things really that I found in my time mudlarking and um, you know what do they tell us I mean when you start mudlarking you're basically looking at sort of things like pottery and then you graduate to learning about not so much more important things but certainly things of greater historical value and things that perhaps tell us um, a bit more of a story. So the kinds of things that, that you know, we find, pottery, tiles, pins, pipes, stems, bits of glass, bones, fossils, tokens and various other bits and pieces. Um, so they're, they're, they can be quite beautiful. Uh, things like, for example, this is a clay pipe bowl from about the 1800s with a sort of acorn design, tiny little acorn on the heel there. Uh, a cod bottle from, again, from Victorian times. Uh, this is a medieval token from around about 1400. Uh, a little gargoyle that's um, being recorded by Stuart at the moment for me, uh, a sort of medieval Kingston ware um, he's actually clutching his private bit, so uh, um, you find about four of these at the bottom of a drinking vessel, um, and as you drank down, they would gradually appear, so that was uh, medieval humour for you. A fragment of pen tile, uh, I love medieval, medieval humour, from 13th, 14th century, sort of shape of a flower there, design typical from any sort of high status building, chapel, castle, palace, townhouse, and so on. Uh, a Roman knit comb, um, what I love about this is that the design hasn't changed <laughs> in 2,000 years. 
made of boxwood, that's about two thirds of one. Um, that was sort of found on, on, on the foreshore. Caused a bit of a sensation because I had the Daily Mail and the Sun uh, contacting me, wanting to do a story about knits from Roman times, whether they came from Romans, indigenous English, or immigrants. So uh, it all got a bit nasty, uh, all got a bit strange. I sort of said, no, I think not. Uh, sometimes you just know where something's going and you know you don't want to be a part of it. Uh, so down here, uh, this is a Micraster echinoid fossil found at Fulham, uh, possibly between 10 million years or so old, I think, possibly a bit, bit older than that, lower Cretaceous, I think, but don't quote me on that. Um, piece of Delft uh, charger, tin glaze, about 1650, 1750, and um, again, a little bell, which um, I thought was a hawking bell until Stuart broke my heart, uh, the FLO, and said so it's probably a bell, could be a hunting bell or something, but it's being recorded um, as I speak. So uh, <coughs> what, what do these things tell us? Well, they're beautiful. Um, they tell us about changing fashions, um, sort of cultural, um, social history references. <coughs> they tell us a bit about geology, maybe. Um, we don't know, for example, what the fossil's doing on the foreshore. Could have come in. Yeah, through the Chilterns maybe, ended up in the Thames via the Chilterns. Lots of chalk beds on, on the Thames, they may be eroding out of that, um, so on and so forth. So um, we do get a picture once you start um, looking at your finds and researching, there's, there's an awful lot that these things can actually tell you about who lived on the river as well, what the river was used for, business and trade um, that, that took place in centuries past. And sometimes you do, you do strike gold, but not in a gold money. And um, it was recorded uh, fairly recently on the Portable Antiquity Scheme, the PAS. And it's from the 16th to 18th century. And it really sort of gave me a shiver down my spine when the history of it came out. You know, this tiny little dice, don't know what it was doing on the foreshore. Maybe somebody was you know, playing a board game, dropped it, came out in some rubbish or whatever. But it's been traced to some excavations that took place on site of the Fleet Prison, um, where about 40 or so similar dice uh, were found. Uh, possibly uh, the, the result of one prisoner who was making them out of uh, bones, uh, meal bones, in order to try and earn a little bit of money. And it's quite sort of um, quite exciting when you can link a find to somebody in the past. They don't know who it was but we know where he was. And the Fleet Prison was, it was a terrible place. It was where debtors and bankrupts went. Uh, Charles Dickens wrote about it quite savagely and in a lot of detail in the Pickwick pa papers. Of course, his own father had been um, a debtor in the Marshall Sea, which was on the South Bank, um, around about 1842, I think. So it, it's really exciting when you find something like that that can be traced to to a particular period in time and uh, a place. Um, ditto a bit of social history as well, which uh, was a sort of rabbit hole that I got lost down in. Um, I found some, just some broken pottery on, on the South Bank uh, underneath Waterloo Bridge. And just took it home, didn't think anything of it. So the initials ABC on, on it. And a bit of research told me this was the Aerated Bread Company how many of you have heard of the Aerated Bread Company? Oh, a few. Oh, I'm really pleased because everybody else I asked hadn't. Um, it was actually a, a, a company founded um, in around about 1862 by a Scottish chemist called Dr. Do John Dalgleish, who discovered that if you dissolve CO2 in water, you can replace yeast in bread. Uh, which sounds disgusting, but uh, it does mean you c you've got basically the first sort of <coughs> manufactured, factory-made, quickly uh, produced bread, like a bit like Mother's Pride, that kind of stuff today. And of course, the Victorians absolutely loved this for their cucumber sandwiches. And very quickly, it, it led to a massive chain of bakeries, confectioners, tea rooms, um, throughout about 150 in London alone by about 1900. And they were sort of a bit like also gre greasy spoon cafes. Uh, and in fact, there is the sort of remnants of one. It's one of those sort of ghost signs. 
uh, which is actually, if you go at the top of a bus going down the Strand, past the Royal Courts of Justice, you can still see that above a Tesco. Uh, so that used to be an aerated bread um, company tea room. And so they're socially significant because they were the first places that women could go to unchaperoned, you know, without losing their reputation and people fainting in horror and all the rest of it. And even more so because the aerated bread company um, in Oxford Circus, above it was the home of the new Somerville Club, where the suffragettes met to uh, plan their sort of campaigns um, and, uh, you know, their, their demonstrations and so on. And I blogged about this. I, I have a little blog, and I blogged about it. And I had somebody get in touch with me who was doing a history of the suffragettes who had only just discovered the link to the aerated bread company, um, the fact that they met above and they planned their campaigns. And what's really sad about it is that most of the archives of the aerated bread company were kept in their factory in Camden, which unfortunately suffered a direct hit during World War II, and a lot of the records have disappeared. So basically, sort of ghost signs and bits of pottery seems to be all that's left of this, this um, place. So, you know, that, that's a sort of whole kind of rabbit hole of social history you get from finds. So, uh, again, just paying homage to TDP and my frog training, and, and it's not just about things for me. I'm now looking at the foreshore with very different eyes. And I live not too far away from here. This is Richmond, southwest London. And this was taken uh, just a few weeks ago in the annual draw-off. And what that means is that where Richmond is, which is almost at the end of the tidal Thames, so, for example, this is the view upstream. There's Richmond Bridge. So you're then going to Twickenham and Teddington, where the tidal Thames begins. And this is the view downstream, so you've got uh, Twickenham Bridge, and then you're going on St. Isleworth, Brentford, Chiswick, Hammersmith, etc., that way going east. Um, the Richmond draw-off takes place once a year when, at the end of October, first two weeks in November, uh, the Port of London Authority come down to Richmond Lock and Weir, which is sort of just, just sort of a bit through there, and they need to do vital repairs, so they open the lock, and that means at low tide... It looks like somebody's pulled the plug on the Thames. So if you're not familiar with that area, and a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't mudlark down here because I think they view most of the time there's nothing to find. In fact, most of the time you can't even get onto the foreshore. But this is a precious time. Last week in October, first two weeks in November, structures start appearing um, that you don't normally see. And um, I first discovered these last year when I went down with Elliot and the monitoring team um, in 2018, because these are the remains um, of the Tudor Stuart Jetty. Uh, and above that would have been the old Tudor Palace at Richmond, where it's Queen Elizabeth I's favourite palace, um, so the story goes, and where she died on the 24th of March, 1603. So that would have been a very important uh, place, sort of landing place for craft and the barges that brought her here. Um, Henry VIII lived there as well. And of course the last occupant was uh, Charles I. When he was executed in 1649, Parliament ordered the palace to be sold and within 10 years it had been pulled down, either bits of it thrown into the river or recycled elsewhere. So this is, this is really, it's quite sort of emotional actually seeing structures like this that you can only see once a year. And I can tell you most residents in Richmond just do not know that that's there. So when I was taking photos, I had lots of people um, walking past uh, above on the embankment going, hey, what are you doing down there? And, and just me tell, explaining what that was. Um, that they were just really surprised. So I sort of made it my personal mission statement to go down here every year and just see what's happening and in fact this year was quite difficult because of the rain river levels just didn't go down very high i mean this is this is much higher than last year and in fact if you can if you can just see here the the sluices are open and there's just constant water being pumped out into the thames this year um, you, you really couldn't see much further that that was the best it got basically so um, Queen Hythe, um, a little mystery here. Again, uh, another way in which I'm, I'm sort of looking at the foreshore with different eyes. Uh, Queen Hythe's the old Saxon port, um, scheduled ancient monument, which means that 
has the same protections as, as Stonehenge. And the actual bit that you can't go on as mudlarks is sort of around about there at low tide. You have to be careful and sort of cross along here not to disturb um, the area uh, too much. And then um, one day last year, in fact, um, I'd got up very early to sort of try and catch the low tide, and I saw this kind of rocking around on the edge of the water. And I thought, oh, what's that? Um, and this other mudlark who was there early, like me, came up and he said, oh, yeah, that's... Uh, so I don't know what it is, but it's been knocking around for about 30, 40 years. Um, I, he hadn't sort of actually thought... I said, oh, do you know what it is? He didn't have a clue. And I put a photo, put that photo out on Twitter. Um, I'm a big tweeter, as, as some of you who follow me will know. All sorts of things that outrage me. I tweet about it. Um, so I put that out on Twitter, and I had all sorts of uh, ideas as to what that might be including uh, one of the dungeon doors from Baynard's Castle, was a suggestion. Um, somebody else suggested uh, a door to a prison cell from the Marshall Sea on the other side of the river. Various lots of things involving dungeons came up, so I think people have got very, very strange ideas about things. Uh, but then eventually, somebody, I think it was whoever was in charge of the TDP um, Twitter feed that day, did correctly guess what it was. Uh, would anybody like to hazard a guess as to what they think this beautiful thing is? Warehouse. Yes, there's a sort of clue there. It's actually one of the platforms. Um, you can probably see them sort of up there. And you've got Bull Wharf and all the other wharves um, that, that were once there. Obviously, it's all new developments now. It's actually one of the platforms from, um, from the wharves, which were on bordering the front on, on the embankment and also tucked in inside as well. And when I looked at that, I was taking quite a few photos, you can still see the chains attached, the nuts and the bolts. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and it would have been sort of lifted and uh, raised and lowered as, as goods were unloaded by cranes from the barges. So uh, again, it's the sort of thing, it just astonished me that people were walking past not really paying much attention, but now that's the kind of thing that I, I look at, and I hope it keeps rocking up over the next 30 years. So um, one of the other things that uh, my TDP training, uh, frog training, has made me do, as I say, is, is look at all sorts of things with, um, with different eyes, um, whether it's old photographs, films, maps, all, all, all sorts of things. I know a lot of mudlarks do that too. A lot of research goes into the embankment and the foreshore, the use of the foreshore. It's not just about blogging about what you found. Um, before I lived in southwest London, I was actually an Ealing girl. And, um, of course, famous Ealing film studios. I'm grateful to them for giving me permission to use these pictures today. This is from the Lavender Hill Mob. And um, it's a film, 1951, directed by Charles Crichton. I'm sure you've seen it many times, starring... Alec Guinness and Stanley Holloway. And Guinness is this sort of mild-mannered bank clerk called Holland, who comes up with this um, great plan to rob his bank of bullion and hide it in mini Eiffel Towers. And of course, it all goes horribly wrong. And, and here he's sort of tied up and trussed up um, in, in that still, um, pretending he's been kind of ambushed by the robbers, but actually he is a part of, of the plan. And what I loved about this um, was actually when the film was on last Christmas, and I'm sure it's going to be on again this Christmas because it's on every Christmas, or <coughs> just like The Sound of Music is on every Easter. So if it's on, do watch it. I just loved the sort of fact, the, the old, you know, this is post-war. You can see here the old Bankside power station there and there. And this is actually Trig Lane Steps, which um, I was absolutely gobsmacked at looking at. Um, so a policeman is trying to uh, try and get hold of him. You've got the old steps here at Trig Lane with the old sort of unrendered brickwork. And again, I was just shouting out, uh, oh, look at the bricks, and they look like this now. Um, the, the, the steps are still there, but you've got, you obviously can see a sort of quite a different bit of work going on there. And the Millennium Bridge just sort of to the right. So, again, the sort of things that I'm, I blame uh, TDP for blaming the, for ruining the family Christmases when I shout out at any film that's got anything to do with the Thames. So, just to conclude, um, 
Mudlarking uh, is about, uh, we find, mudlarks find lost, dispossessed and, and broken things. Um, the fragments that we find, we don't know who lost them, necessarily where they came from a lot of the time, um, or their journey in the river, but they do add to our knowledge in lots of different ways of the past, even when the archaeological providence is unclear. And also the changing use of the Thames foreshore and its hinterland is something that's become uh, very important to me through, through the frog training. So this is a custom house from last year, and I guess the kind of thing that I do now, if, if you're going down this year, you'll notice a lot of that gravel is shifting slowly onto the mud there. Um, and there's lots of interesting finds coming out now because you can actually walk there without <coughs> sinking into it as opposed to only being able to walk up here to sort of where the old Billingsgate uh, fish market was up there. But if I don't find anything, it doesn't matter. You know, I can take photographs, I sort of monitor what I see, if there are any changes in revetments and the, you know, the, the sort of the, the Georgian barge beds up the far end. Um, and just enjoy being on the foreshore, but looking at things with fresh eyes. So thank you for listening. Thank you.